Let's start uh, again with a uh, with a part on uh, formulating questions. We we've already seen uh, when when we discussed interviews um, the issues on formulating questions. Here we will go more in depth uh, into this topic. Many of the things that I would say uh, that I would say here also apply to um, to interviews. So consider that. Uh, uh, for for any for question formulation related to questioners, uh, hints and suggestions uh, are applicable also uh, for interviews. Uh, first of all, what to ask uh, before before going into um, into how to ask actually what are the what are the mistakes or the strategies for for asking and formulating appropriate uh, questions. Of course, it depends on the unit of, of analysis. And uh, um, th this is uh, uh, concerning the demographic information that you may want to collect, uh, for example, for individuals, uh, if your unit of analysis of individuals, you may want to collect demographic information about their experience in the research context, in software engineering, current professional role, location, and academic degree. This is all demographic information that you may want to know from an individual. If you are dealing with the unit of analysis the project of a project team, then you want to know the size of the team, the domain, the physical distribution, whether they are mm, communicating uh, uh, in person or they are mostly uh, they are mostly in a, in a global team and they are interacting with the video conferences because this is also relevant for uh, for the for the process for the development process and uh, and it may affect the answer that you get of course so anything demographic that can affect the answer that you get it needs to be needs to be considered or uh, it can be organization and in this case in the organizations uh, you may want to collect the size of the organization the industry segments so the domain the location the type of organization so if it's government a private company university etc so these are depend this is to highlight that what to ask in terms of demographic information especially depends uh, on the unit of analysis that you are interested in. So consider that uh, uh, the unit of the analysis is crucial to understand what are the demographic information that you should collect. Uh, of course, it depends what to ask in general. Uh, it depends also on the research question. So the unit of analysis affects uh, also the demographic information and in your research questions uh, can affect uh, your actual questions in the questionnaire. Uh, we may open uh, a discussion on, uh, on the relationship between one single research question that is related to a construct uh, and many questions uh, that may evaluate variables that are all associated to the same constructs. But this would lead us uh, too, too far away. In general, the intuition is that uh, the research questions, of course, in, are less in terms of numbers and in number and are more generic than the actual questions uh, that you that you ask to the people and therefore um, more questions uh, are normally used uh, norm uh, more survey questions are normally used to answer the same research questions this is not the case in this exemplified uh, case but uh, it is uh, but it is common in real world questionnaires and i will give you examples uh, in, in this presentation. Uh, for example, here you have a research question that is which are the most frequent requirements set, defects? And uh, uh, you, you, may, you may ask uh, as uh, more refined, let's say, survey question, how frequently do you encounter, do you encounter this type of requirements defect? And you list ambiguity, incompleteness, grammar error, etc. And uh, you ask them to write whether they they encounter them seldom, never, sometimes, often, very often, according to the so-called uh, Likert scale, in which you have this uh, mm, this ordinal uh, this ordinal scale, uh, and or you may have uh, you may be interesting interested in knowing how difficult are, are these defects, and this uh, this would be the the question in your in your question. So just to show you that. There is a relationship in, uh, between your research question and the questions in your questionnaire. 
their relationship is not necessarily one to one. Of course, the question in your questionnaire, and in most of the cases, is not one to one. The questions in your questionnaire are uh, multiple and more accurate than your, more precise than your research questions. And an issue is, is uh, how to select this ambiguity, incompleteness, grammar error, so the categories of error. Either I have performed an interview, interviews beforehand, or I have to resort to the literature. So the theory that leads, that guides my study uh, is either coming from the literature or from preliminary interviews. In this case, probably is more likely to come from, uh, the, from the literature. But uh, one thing to remark here is that uh, here these are just words, ambiguity, incompleteness, grammar error. You have to provide also examples and uh, interpretation. So the concept of ambiguity, for example, is very ambiguous because uh, ambiguity normally means uh, something that can have uh, uh, multiple interpretations. But someone may find ambiguous also a statement that is not clear, not easy to understand. So the things uh, uh, it, it is very it is very important that uh, you also describe and communicate clearly what is the meaning of the terms that you use and this uh, make you understand that very often since you are want to reach a very large uh, a very large um, uh, sample a very large number of people uh, you have to uh, you cannot ask things uh, that are too complex because things that are too complex require a language that is uh, complex as well. And uh, uh, if a person is not using the jargon, does, know, does not know the actual meaning of the, those uh, uh, specific words, uh, they may answer in a way that is not representative of the reality for you. So in practice, uh, uh, if what they mean by incompleteness or ambiguity is not what you mean with that term then you have a completely different uh, answer from to your question because you didn't pose it in the proper way and the person didn't understand properly this uh, is one tricky thing that uh, highly affects uh, the possibilities that you have uh, with a survey so that always leads to vague uh, let's say so to commonly agreed definition and does not allow you to ask things uh, that are very, very um, detailed and require <coughs> an agreement uh, among technical, technical terms. Uh, what to ask? Uh, I mentioned that you can, uh, you can um, rely to the literature, but you can also, it is very, very useful to organize uh, fourth course groups. So, a group of people uh, that are giving different viewpoints, uh, are experts on the topic, and uh, can give you some uh, useful information. And uh, uh, you give, uh, you group them in the same space or in a phone call now, and you give them five to ten minutes. For example, a set of relevant questions on that are related to your topic. So. You have already elaborated your research question or your main objective or research, and uh, you ask these people, uh, okay, take five, 10 minutes to write in a piece of paper without interacting with each other, what would be the relevant question? And then uh, you ask them to read them, read them aloud, and you brainstorm on the proposal to come up to a set of uh, uh, questions. In some cases, you can also refer to the literature to identify existing options. For example, if I want to understand uh, the impact of requirements for a specific phase of the software process, how do I name the phases? The name of the phases. In this case, I have to resort to the literature. Uh, is maintenance a phase of the software process? I don't know. I have to, uh, I have to consider a certain reference framework uh, in which some names are listed and they are defined because what is design in my company can be different from design in your company but i want to uh, i want to have um, comparable situations so i have also to briefly describe 
what is what I mean by design if I speak about a phase in a question. So you see again there are tricky tricky issues, and uh, um, this of course if you are dealing with uh, uh, with a domain that somewhat you know or what is that is uh, quite established in the literature. If you are dealing with uh, with a public that you don't know, the best thing so you're dealing with. Um, a very specific domain that uh, you are not expert in and uh, you don't know the jargon, um, you may first interview the people there. So select some representative people, uh, you identify the terminology that they used and the relevant question and afterwards you create the question. So the question stems uh, from an interview in which you understand the terminology, you understand what they don't understand uh, in your your typical terminology, and afterwards you you develop your questionnaire. Um, again, what to ask? There are several types of questions. Here is just uh, this categorization. It's just to give you a list of example. You can ask uh, uh, personal questions. So, what is your role? Uh, or you can uh, ask a question about other people. How old uh, are in average developers in your company? Or um, you, 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 can, you can ask questions uh, to the subject that are related to the unit of interest. For example, if the unit of interest is the organization or the company, uh, you ask, does your company employ external suppliers? So this, in this case, uh, the subject uh, is uh, the subject is answering uh, um, an, uh, an, a, a question that is uh, um, as a representative of the company. They can be about attitude and they can be about belief. Attitude, uh, it's, it's for example, my job is typically interesting, and they have to answer disagree or agree. And this, they have to give a judgment. And uh, uh, beliefs are slightly diff uh, different, actually, because uh, if you see this example, are related to what you believe it is true, uh, not uh, uh, about a judge. No, it, they are not related to a judgment about something. So, for example, a belief can be incorrect requirements tend to result in code errors, never always. So these are the set of uh, answers that you can give. Remember that attitudes and beliefs are different, so you have to use uh, different scales when after answering. So always use uh, the same scale if you are speaking about uh, even different attitudes. So my job is typically interesting. The task uh, is very hard to me. Disagree, agree. But uh, use uh, other, other type of answers for beliefs to make this distinction clear. Um, <clears throat> And this, you you have uh, you have other you have uh, other type of example questions. Let's say so. This is the typical question that you may find uh, in a in a you, you may need to define in your questionnaire. Uh, what are the main qualities of a questionnaire? Clarity, comprehensiveness, and acceptability. As uh, I tried to remark several times, the main most important thing is that people understand what you're asking. Okay, and uh, you have to understand whether the choices that you've listed are sufficient to elicit the desired information. So, have you covered the choice uh, that uh, with the wording that is sufficiently clear and so sufficiently understandable by everyone, but at the same time sufficiently precise, precise to get you the information that you want? This is a very hard balance. Uh, it may seem straightforward to write down a questionnaire, but the preparation is very, very complex, and you may need several and several iterations, especially if you are dealing with the domain experts or experts that are not software engineers but need to be involved in the loop of software development. Um, comprehensiveness. So, I am, am I covering anything that is uh, that, that is important? And did I did I did I introduce some irrelevant, incomplete, or redundant aspects in uh, in this uh, in this questionnaire? And finally, uh, acceptability. The questionnaire cannot be too long, cannot ask too much time uh, to the people, and cannot invite invade uh, the privacy of the respondents. So it is uh, it is important that. If you would receive the questionnaire from, uh, uh, from from another researcher, 
you would feel comfortable to fill that questionnaire and you wouldn't feel that you are spending too much time. Half an hour questionnaire is too much, okay? Half an hour questionnaire is uh, way too long. 10 minutes questionnaire is acceptable, five minutes questionnaire is way better. Of course, there is always the balance between uh, uh, acceptability for, for the person and acceptability for you. So how much information are you able to get? Another key issue is not just the single question, but the whole structure of the questionnaire, okay? The whole structure of the questionnaire needs to be carefully, uh, carefully considered. First, first uh, things, uh, you should uh, include uh, questions that are introductory. So easy to answer, demographic, but not sensitive. So demographic that are speaking about you, but uh, not too personal. The sensitive and personal questions just uh, if needed and just uh, at the end, okay, if this is, uh, if this is, uh, if, if this is strictly needed. Of course, group by topic and create a logical sequence between, uh, between uh, the questions, the group of topics, so from the general to the detailed. No, do not start with detailed and then pass to general. Do not go, do not return to a topic if you already discussed it. So grouping, clustering the questions is really, is really key. You can use, uh, but uh, it's, prefer it's preferable not to use uh, the filter or screening questions. So questions in which you decide, based on which you decide whether a certain respondent uh, um, should answer another group of questions or not. So if certain questions should be skipped by the respondent, this complicates a lot the, the analysis. And this leads to uh, nested structures that, uh, that are basically structured associated to different groups of uh, answers, different groups of questions uh, associated to different groups uh, of uh, respondents based uh, on the input that they give you, based on the, based on the answers that they give you. This uh, complicates too much the, the questionnaire and uh, its analysis. So if you have too many nested structure, probably you need to revise your design. And uh, you can also have the reliability check. So uh, reformulate some for some question that you are unsure whether, uh, which, whether the, the person have actually understood clearly the meaning, um, you can rephrase them. Of course, there is the risk that in rephrasing, you are not conveying the same meaning, but exactly the same meaning. But uh, uh, by repeating, in different points, of course, not one after the other, but in different points, uh, two related uh, questions, if there is consistency between the score, you may be pretty sure that uh, that person actually uh, is in line with you with the, with the meaning of the question, if they give the same answer to the mm, first formulation and the rephrasing of the same question. These are reliability checks, so checks uh, to see if uh, the, you are communicating in a way that is clear or not. So if the answer that you got uh, is actually the one, uh, the answer to the question that you asked, <laughs> that, or that you wanted to ask. Types of question, we've discussed this um, somehow already. So there can be open-ended questions. So the respondent can write free text, can be short text, uh, or long text, but free text, so something that is not uh, a checkbox uh, or, or a list uh, or a list from which to select. In that case, we speak about closed-ended questions. So I have a set of alternative, and I have uh, multiple choice uh, with a with a select maximum five option or select maximum one option, or so exclusive. Uh, and uh, or a Likert scale. Likert scale is uh, is the one that was exemplified before. So uh, I agree, I don't agree, I strongly agree, uh, or this never happens, this always happens. This uh, type of scale that are ordinal scale. Uh, there are, of course, uh, uh, pros and cons uh, of uh, open-ended and closed-ended question. Here in this slide, you see an overview. In an open-ended question, in general, you have the benefit that the respondent can use personal words, so their own terminology. So it is more likely that uh, they convey to you 
the, the actual meaning that they have in mind. With close-ended, this is more likely because you have just a cross on, and you, on, a, on, a certain, on a certain slot, so on a certain word, and you don't have the confirmation that they have actually understood your question. And you can un uh, identify unusual answers because it's word. In general, they are not typically leading, so you are not uh, constraining the answers that they give you. They can write whatever they want. And they are very useful if you need to explore new areas. You, are no, you don't know yet which could be the possible choices. Uh, of course, these require time. This requires time for you to analyze and for the person to write down. So open questions uh, very often lead to lower response rate, higher time for analysis. Uh, why? Because answers need to be coded. Uh, answers may be not clear because, of course, it's word, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's natural language and it's ambiguous. They are more complicated to process. In the case uh, of, uh, of um, open-ended questions, you still have uh, spontaneous exhaustive answers and you can have different perceptions of scales. This is not possible in general with closed-ended questions. Closed-ended questions, uh, uh, they are more time effective and you get clear answers and they're easy to process. So the thing is, uh, always prefer closed-ended questions. If you have to do open-ended question, think about uh, uh, performing preliminary interviews first. Or if you have to use open-ended question, you cannot expect to ask this uh, to a population that is too vast, too, too large. Because otherwise, the processing time could be completely uh, time uh, time consuming. Why way time consuming? Okay, especially also because of this issue related to compatible answers. Uh, because uh, you may have uh, completely different answers, how to merge them. So it takes a lot of time to analyze. Uh, final tips. So uh, tips for analyzing uh, if your questions are okay. Given a question, how would you answer it? So try to, to, to understand whether it's clear by providing an answer. An answer. Test it with peers for the initial draft. Pilot the questions with uh, some respondents, so as, uh, feedback to get feedback. And, uh, mm, and always remember this thing about the terminologies. Uh, that can be used by your respondent. They may use a, a terminology that, uh, uh, that is not uh, known to you. So if you are dealing with a new field, always uh, uh, perform uh, preliminary and structured interviews to understand the typical terminology. And of course, pilot, pilot, pilot. Before, uh, again, I remark that uh, uh, you have one single shot. So uh, it's better if you, uh, if you perform your questionnaire in a restricted group and assess it several times. And uh, when you deliver your question, you're sure that, is, uh, uh, that they are as clear as possible. Other tips on your questions, uh, avoid vague and ambiguous questions and answer. For example, how often does your group have meetings? Between uh, often and never. Often and never may mean several things, OK? So uh, to be clearer, you can just ask, how frequently does your group have meetings? Once a day, once per week, et cetera. Always avoid double negatives. Do you consider not appropriate to avoid testing? So double negative is uh, quite confusing to process. Uh, it slows down and uh, it slows down the, the processing. And uh, you may have a uh, wrong answer. Avoid long questions for the same reason. Avoid questions that are too general, because uh, <clears throat> maybe the, because for example, what is the general physical, intellectual, and moral condition of men and women employed in your group? This is way too general. It's like asking them uh, to write an essay about a certain topic, and uh, you may end up having two uh, uncomparable answers from different people. Uh, avoid double barrel question. How does it satisfy that you with the space and the colleagues? So you are asking two things at the same time. OK. Um, or what testing environment do you normally use? You can also have uh, uh, no testing environment in use. So this, this can be 
questions that you have to consider in practice that uh, are not uh, are not useful to ask are not uh, appropriate to ask avoid of course uh, technical terms uh, again uh, let's be general and uh, let's try to be precise at the same time but not too technical because otherwise you may have no answer for certain question and uh, uh, prefer forced choice answers instead of all that apply so all that apply um, means that uh, uh, for each choice you 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 you, you uh, it is better that you have uh, a set of closed uh, a set of closed answer with uh, also a limited number of uh, of possible answer if you have multiple choice questions what can be the type of uh, responses the type of responsive uh, uh, policies we've seen uh, some example of Ricker scale Ricker scale that are quite common uh, typical for closed question and uh, they have uh, some limits in the statistical analysis but uh, they are widely used mm, in some cases you use nominal nominal scale very rare uh, to use interval scales, but uh, quite common to have a free text at least short, but they require open coding or numeric values. Uh, numeric values, of course, uh, can give you uh, the possibility of performing many more uh, statistical analysis, uh, much more statistics. So these are examples of format for the same question that uh, I've taken from this, uh, this set of slides. Here is asking, do you have experience in Java programming? Yes or no. But you can ask also, how much experience do you have in terms of years? In this case, you have a number, and it's uh, it's clear. Um, how much experience do you have? A high experience, very high. Few here is very vague, as you understand, because my understanding of high may be different from yours. Uh, it is better the other one, like how much experience do you have in Java pro programming? Three to five years, uh, one to three years, if you want uh, this, uh, these layers, this group. But of course, this can be inferred also if you, if you have the, the, second, uh, the, second, uh, the second choice. It is hard that you ask uh, an open-ended question, of course. How much experience do you have in Java programming? You have, a, a, in this case, you have an open-ended question and you have to analyze it for something that probably you just want to know uh, the number of years and is sufficient for you. Uh, use standardized answers. So because standardized answers in the sense that uh, if you are using a certain format with a Likert scale, adopt it uh, every time except to distinguish, uh, ex except to distinguish uh, between, uh, mm, between uh, things about beliefs uh, or opinions okay so uh, used uh, uh, use statements that uh, are are quite uh, that are similar or are the same uh, the, for for indicating the agreement so for strongly agree agree disagree or strongly disagree uh, or undecided or neutral normally there is also this uh, this option but the issue is uh, be standard uh, try to be better to be repetitive uh, because this makes the feeling of the questioner faster. Um, there are not just questions, of course. Whenever you, if, you, if you've ever filled uh, a survey or a questionnaire, there is always a preliminary explanation because you have to think that these, are, these may be, be people that uh, are not known to you, so they don't know you. You have to convince them uh, uh, that uh, that their opinion is valuable. So you have to explain the purpose of the study and you have to, uh, to write down why they should, uh, they, should, um, they should fill the questionnaire, how to return the questionnaire, why you've chosen them precisely, and uh, uh, especially is it fundamental the time required to complete uh, the questionnaire. Also consider privacy issues. Uh, uh, privacy issues will be will be treated uh, will be treated later on, and uh, it is fundamental, especially for, uh, since uh, the introduction of uh, GDPR, this norm, uh, European norm uh, for handling of personal data in surveys, uh, in both research and any type of uh, survey. Uh, let's see a set of tips. These were tips for uh, for, for for interview for. Um, uh, formulating questions uh, I, I i was uh, i went quite fast because these are simple things to understand it's just uh, 
hints uh, and aspects that you should consider and uh, wanted to to cover briefly and you can get back to the slides uh, but uh, uh, the thing is uh, uh, to understand how to do a survey as yes, for many of the activities that uh, i described like interviews observation you have to perform them there is a an experience coming from practice from which these tips are derived in the end that uh, uh, that you get uh, just through the practice so this is our pointers but without the practice uh, you you will not see uh, the actual importance for example of piloting and the actual difficulty of balancing between generality and precision in formulating questions so these are tips tips for recruiting it is very very important that you send individual or but standard invitation messages so it has to be clear for the person who received the message that uh, the, you were sending the message uh, just to them okay although you are using a standard invitation message but in the message there must be the name of the of the person of course if you have got their email you have to explain in the email uh, um, you have to explain the email uh, in a standardized form all the information about your questionnaire the motivation etc but you are, it, it needs to be clear that uh, um, that you are interested in them okay uh, never allow forwarding because if you've done the sampling the way we said uh, if they are forwarding to someone else and someone else respond uh, this will violate the sample so you need to uh, send an individual questionnaire for each subject and uh, uh, allow a time that is reasonable like one two weeks for a 10 minute survey and uh, the possibility of giving a reward so you can do a raffle so prizes uh, for for part of the for part of the respondents donations uh, or actual payments uh, if the questionnaire is too long if it's 30 minutes uh, people may need to be paid and uh, uh, or simply sharing the results of the of the questionnaire once it's finished this depends of course uh, on the on the context but some type of reward uh, may facilitate the collection uh, the collection of uh, of information avoid always uh, recruiting to random websites or recruiting random people by posting your survey in your web page this doesn't work okay this doesn't work because people will not answer and uh, on, the, on the other hand uh, especially for software engineering uh, aspects and on the other hand you may violate your sample because you are not sure that the same person is not answering many times although this is very unlikely to happen the, the most likely thing that happened is that no one answers it happened to me that uh, there was uh, uh, there was this episode in which uh, uh, we performed a questionnaire uh, in a conference and afterwards we posted also the the questionnaire online so people could fill it we just got uh, one answer to the to the to the one of online so it's a waste of time unless you do an online survey but you contact the each individual expecting 10 percent replies eh? remember also that reminding reminders should be used uh, with care so not do not remind to those who already participated and reminder need to be just once because you may need to involve these people in other questionnaires so it's not uh, it's not useful to uh, to get them uh, bored if, if they don't answer the first time and not the second time it is very unlikely that uh, that uh, they will uh, they will uh, answer again uh, piloting again this is uh, another remark and here i wanted to uh, to list what you should pilot because not just the question you have to pilot the population to understand whether those people are coming from your uh, frame are the actual one the, the one that are uh, most appropriate to answer your question so select those people and try to understand beforehand uh, whether they are appropriate for your for your questions part of the question so this means that the questioner needs to be ambiguous clear etc and to, to be complete as I said, so it does have to cover 
all the all the issues and get feedback from this piloting with uh, some candidates colleagues uh, experts pilot the recruitment how effective is this strategy so if i send the email this way did i recruit uh, did i recruit enough people did i get the answer did i get the answers i want was my email too long uh, do I get this 10% of answer in practice if I send these, uh, if I send these 20 emails, for example? So these are things that uh, you, you have to consider also to adjust the presentation of your questionnaire and pilot the data analysis. Because, and this is uh, crucial, it's very key, because uh, you have all your answers. And you have to understand how to elaborate these, uh, these numbers into frequencies and or these words into codes and to frequencies in a way that may lead you to uh, relevant or like representative results. So pilot also the data analysis. When, when, you, send, uh, when you send the questionnaire for the actual, uh, for the actual survey, uh, you need to have already clear in mind uh, where you are going and the type of plot that you're gonna make, okay? Privacy, we mentioned it uh, several times now, and uh, it's useful here to, to discuss this. Here you have a reference for a large set of slides that are concerned with the uh, data, uh, data privacy and the general data protection regulation. This set of slides is uh, 171 or 180 slides, so it's very in-depth uh, analysis of this regulation that has impacted uh, the um, Mm, the, 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 basically, the, any, uh, any processing of data in the European Union since 2000, May 2018, and that basically uh, explain uh, how to handle personal data. Uh, this general data protection regulation, shortly GDPR, um, actually applies to any task dealing with personal data. So not just research surveys, also any data that is collected to cameras uh, or the data that is collected by your apps, uh, websites, uh, etc. Personal data is any data that allows to somewhat identify you. And it's related to, uh, to a natural person, so a subject, okay? can be related to your, for example, your name, your email address, your one identification number, uh, or some information related to the physical, physiological, genetic, mental, economical, cultural, social identity of that specific person. Personal data is not just, uh, uh, is, is not, a certain, a certain information is not necessarily, um, is, uh, can be personal, also, if uh, you can use other databases of information to understand uh, who the respondent is, okay? If, for example, I'm uh, uh, interviewing in a company and there is just one manager and I'm asking the role and the role is the manager, of course I can identify that person. And that is the specific questionnaire for, for them. Or uh, this is unrelated, but in an exam, if I if I do if if me as a teacher I don't have to know who wrote the exam but someone uh, just one person that is uh, English speaking and it's writing down the exam in English while the others are using Italian of course that per that person is identifiable and that uh, uh, that that information so the language that is using identifies that person. So personal data is uh, quite uh, is quite tricky, but is anything that allows to identify someone. If you distribute your surveys anonymously and you do not process personal data, then you can disregard G GDPR. But basically, in practice, first of all, uh, in these examples that we made, you are sampling people. So you are identifying them through email and through their contact. Okay, so it's very likely that you are collecting uh, personal data and you have to uh, consider GDPR because also the IP address or if, you, if cookies, this type of information is, uh, is uh, personal data, okay? 
And in addition, if you, if you want to distinguish between a questionnaire, if you don't want to allow the same person to fill the questionnaire, you need to collect personal data, for example, the IP address. So this is, uh, there is, uh, this is a strict constraint. Uh, what, as I said, is, uh, is, a vast, is a vast topic, okay? Is a vast topic, but here we want to simply touch the fact that you have to consider it in your service. The law say that you must obtain freely given, specific, informed, and unambiguous consent when you collect their personal data, so the data that I mentioned. So you should not force people to respond or fill out your surveys uh, or trick them to collect their personal data, both data given explicitly and data collected in an implicit way. So their IP address, as mentioned, this could be, uh, or their location, for example. Right, like uh, like for for the different uh, for the different tool that you use. So you need uh, you need an agreement. Uh, also, you need uh, delete the information that you have collected if they request. So they are authorized to ask you. You need to delete this information that you collected about me. <clears throat> for this, uh, you need to produce a privacy policy. So this may may look uh, some. Uh, somewhat uh, on the legal side uh, that, uh, that may not interest you as a researcher, but it needs to interest you because ethics uh, is, a, is everywhere and these legal aspects are, every, are everywhere. Also in experiments, we didn't see probably if there is time, I will show you the, um, the informed consent, an example of informed consent form. Every time you deal with another person and this is involved in your research, you need to do some, uh, uh, some bureaucratic uh, module uh, and you need to ask their consent for something. For surveys, uh, at least you have the guideline of the GDPR, which is very generic, but at least tell you some very clear thing, like you need to specify a privacy policy when, where you should explain what you collect precisely. So are you collecting the email, the name, the IP address, and uh, how so by asking them explicit question or by collecting automatically and uh, the reason why you collect this data so you have to explain what's your use why in your survey do you need to know their ip, ad IP address to contact them later to or or their email to contact them later to clearly identify them is it really needed their email address so this type of uh, explanation and how the data will be processed uh, Will you have other third party subjects that will have access to your data? And who are these third party subjects? Um, so, this, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, also important to consider when writing your GD, where you're writing your privacy policy. And also, finally, how long will you keep the data? So, this is uh, uh, for because, uh, because of the issue on. Uh, um, on the right to be forgotten, uh, you need to establish uh, a final point in which you get rid of those data. You cannot keep them in your database uh, forever. Uh, then you have to explain how secure is the data is your possession. So you have to clearly explain what security approaches you are using for ensuring that no one else accesses that database and uh, uh, clarify the rights. So rights to ask, access, view and edit the data. So the data, you have to remember that these data are not yours. Personal data are from the person that gave them to you. And giving them to you doesn't say that now these are your possession. These are still in the possession of the person. The data, the owner, uh, the data owner is the responsible is the person who responded. So they have any right on those, uh, on those data. Finally, who to contact. Uh, in each organization, you should have a data protection officer, so a subject that is in charge of answering and dealing with any question related to privacy. Writing a privacy policy is complex. You can search in the various websites in internet. They all have a privacy policy. You can take inspiration from them. But one thing that uh, is important to consider in your questionnaire is that uh, instead of writing down the privacy policy as a first page, uh, you write a privacy notice. So 
a short notice, uh, not in legalese, uh, but in, uh, but, uh, in uh, normal language uh, that explain easily what uh, uh, is, is the various points uh, of, uh, uh, of the privacy policy. So why and how are you collecting, transparency aspect, data retention, contact person, etc. And here you see the example. We want to understand the why and how. We want to understand the typical problem of software engineering students. For this, we need your contribution for this survey. The survey takes five to 10 minutes to complete. Together with our opinion, we'll ask your personal data, such as your email address, to ask you follow-up questions. And then you explain when uh, are you going to get rid of this data. Then you give a link, of course, to uh, the privacy policy. This will open a new page in which there is all the detailed privacy policy that you've written down. But the key thing is this needs to be short and needs to be at the beginning of your questionnaire explaining why you you are uh, getting the personal data where is the privacy policy no one will look at it okay but uh, this needs to be uh, to make it clear that you have established uh, uh, a way of dealing with privacy and you have also a contact person for this type of matters Let's pass to threats to validity, and uh, we, we're almost done with this lecture because threats to validity are much simpler in, in, the, in surveys than in, um, than in experiments. There are two types of, of validity here. There are reliability and uh, validity. Normally, uh, to, to ensure this, uh, you don't have so many, so many means. Uh, normally, you just have the focus groups, the pilot test that can ensure that you uh, that your study doesn't have too many doesn't pose too many threats to validity your study design reliability is concerned with how well we can reproduce the survey data as well as the extent of measurement error that is a survey is reliable if we get the same kinds and distribution of answer when we administer the survey to two similar groups of respondents as you can understand, this is related to how accurately I have selected my sample, because this is related to the actual confidence level and confidence interval, because confidence level uh, indicates how confident am I that I will have the same interval of results when I uh, repeat the survey in the same population with a different sample but with the same size okay and validity is concerned with how well the instrument measures what is supposed to measure so this is similar to the internal uh, validity and construct validity that we'll always uh, we've always discussed uh, reliability types there are multiple types you can refer to the book that i pointed out at the beginning it's uh, the list is longer than here but mainly there are these three kinds. One is test retest reliability, so intra observer. That simply means how likely is that the person responds in the same way is surveyed twice. So uh, you have to understand whether the question is sufficiently clear and uh, to answer, easy to answer, that the person that if you interview the same person with the same question twice, they give exactly the same answer. How to ensure that during piloting, you have to repeat the question to the same person. So survey twice the same subjects and check the correlation between the answer. If correlation in general is greater than 0 0.5, you can be sure that um, intra-observer reliability is high. This is always done in a subgroup. Inter-rated reliability, to which extent different observers give similar answers when they assess the same situation. This is very complicated and it's not so common because you need to use two pilots with different samples and check the correlation between the distribution of the answers. So check that these samples are somewhat equivalent, both representative and uh, you have uh, uh, the same distribution. This interrated reliability is, uh, is, is quite uncommon to evaluate in practice. So it's a threat that you always have. And uh, um, to, to mitigate it, you normally resort to, uh, to say that you've done, uh, you've done uh, effort to reduce uh, 
this uh, the, the, the possibility of low interrate reliability by revising the questions with the experts and by piloting them. Inter and by receiving feedback on the meaning of the question or asking uh, some people to rephrase the questions, uh, piloting is always a way to assess that uh, this, uh, this reliability is ensured. There is another reliability that is related to the analysis of data, that is intercoded reliability. If you have open questions, you have to ask yourself how reliable is the coding procedure? So when you are doing uh, thematic analysis of the open questions, how, how, how sure are you that, uh, uh, that this coding is reliable? To, 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 ensure, to ensure that the subjectivity is not too high, basically you normally have to take two coders, they do, uh, they do coding in parallel, then they meet, and they select a list of master codes, so the codes that will be applied in the reporting of the data, and then they reapply this code individually to the answers, to the answers that they got. So they try independently whether these codes that have been decided actually work. If there is a certain agreement uh, that is um, that is made with the Crippendorf Alpha, which I don't, uh, which you can check in Wikipedia as a as an evaluation measure, then you can say, okay, there is a high intercoder reliability. Normally, zero point eight, if you, if you want it uh, to be to be high and acceptable for this type of study. Mm, yeah, so this is, uh, this is important when you have open questions. Uh, this already indicates to you that open questions make things way more complicated because you need two people to do the analysis, uh, etc. So this, is, this is gives you a flavor of what's behind uh, all the easy data because like, the answers to surveys uh, are very easy to read. But behind that, there is uh, a lot of complicated activities uh, that, uh, that need to be performed. And this uh, coding is one of them. Validity type is uh, content validity and uh, is related to how good is, uh, is the questioner, basically, and uh, how good is the questioner from the point of view of experts of the subject matter. So you need to perform a focus group to pilot and assess uh, how good is the questioner and uh, revise it. Construct validity is to which extent as the construct related to my measured variable. Uh, in this case, you have to link the constructs that you use, the things that you want to evaluate to the actual question. So each question, each question needs to be clearly related to the research question, as I pointed out at the beginning of the lecture. Um, there are um, other type of validity that you find in the, in the book. That, uh, but are applicable just when the survey is repeated many times so to check uh, to which extent uh, uh, your new results are valid with respect to old results uh, on the same population. And let's finish with uh, an example survey in software engineering that is an ongoing uh, endeavor and uh, it's called the NAPIRE, Naming the Pain in Requirements Engineering. So it's in software engineering, but it's specifically focused on requirements engineering that we recall is the early phase but uh, of requirement of, uh, of software engineering but it's pervasive throughout the software process because requirements are everywhere uh, throughout the software throughout the software process and uh, is oriented to understand what are the contemporary problems causes and effects in industrial practice at this link, uh, this is the first link, you can explore the current results because this is an ongoing survey with different companies. And there is a paper, and there is a paper that uh, you can freely download uh, from here with, uh, with the results of the survey. So basically, they started with uh, these three simple research questions. Okay, this gives us uh, an indication of relation between research questions and uh, the actual questions. And, uh, and they are, which contemporary problems exist in RE? What are observable patterns of problems and context characteristics? What are their perceived, perceived causes and effects? Just these three questions. So problems, problems in relation to the context, and causes and effects of this problem at the level of the process. 
this is a, a part of the questions. So you have some demographics, so that characterize the context, of course. And you have some, some questions that are closed, some questions that are open. For example, what is the size of your company? You have to select a choice. Uh, for example, they, they, they were related maybe to the number of employees normally. Please describe the main business area and application domain. This was an open question, so they have to write down the type of domain. It is kept open because they may use different terminology. So you may need to cluster uh, afterwards the company by, by type. Uh, and then other, other example of questions that are all demographic. You understand that this is to characterize the different, uh, the different companies and the different respondents. And possibly, you already see that possibly allow you to do some uh, controlled experiment, uh, virtual experiment, let's say, but some hypothesis testing, for example, to check uh, do safety uh, do safety related companies have different problems with respect uh, to uh, non-safety related companies? These are answer and hypotheses that you can test with your data. So you see that uh, this qualitative uh, inquiry somewhat uh, can be very precise uh, like uh, an experiment somehow but very large and on quite general issues uh, then you can ask here they are asking other uh, other questions for example for problems uh, they are asking considering your personal experiences how do the following problems in requirements engineering apply to your projects and they have a list of problems with associated leakage scale. So this is, uh, with, this is uh, similar to the example that I provided uh, at the beginning. Uh, and then ask, which causes do they have? And these, you have open questions because uh, you still don't know. You, you, you don't know. you know typical problems in requirements engineering, but maybe your theory doesn't allow you to, uh, to list typical question and you want to identify this question exactly from this question and you need to code them. These are part of the results uh, represented with this, uh, uh, with, a, with this type of plot uh, that it may puts in relation causes uh, and problems. Uh, so here the, they identify lack of time, for example, lack of time as an impact is the cause for uh for uh, time but not enough time in general uh, weak access to customer uh, needs internal business information so you see the sides uh, let's say the, how to read this uh, the uh, larger is the is the is the bar the higher is the impact uh, on uh, on the type of uh, on the type of requirements uh, of the type of requirement problem so the link between the cause uh, the requirement problem and the effect that can be either project failed or project uh, completed. So they, they've been able from this questionnaire to elaborate uh, this uh, theory because you understand this is similar to the theory that we've seen, uh, that we've seen up to now. So <clears throat> I invite you to, to go to that link uh, and check uh, in internet because there is a lot of interesting information coming from several companies across different sectors uh, and is one of the few uh, quite established theory and ongoing efforts uh, to, um, to define general theories for software engineering. So summary of this lecture, I've been, uh, uh, I've been trying to cover surveys uh, in just one, uh, one lecture uh, because uh, they are relevant, but for getting all the statistics and these other aspects, uh, you need uh, much, much more time, of course. But it's, uh, it's something that uh, it's something that is important to consider because uh, it's uh, it's the typical hybrid method between qualitative and quantitative research. The intuition that I, that the, the the reason why I wanted to place it at this point of the course is that you've seen experiments and you see qualitative analysis. Now you see a way in which these strategies uh, can be mixed to a specific uh, uh, towards a specific goal, and uh, this gives you uh, already the idea that these classes that we've created. Uh, uh, you need to master them well because in any context 
you may need to rearrange them for achieving the objective that you want. Surveys are um, quite uh, uh, well defined, specific, and widely used. Also, in common life, elections are a survey, basically. So, the, this is uh, uh, the, the electoral election list uh, is a sampling frame, basically. So, uh, it is important to know because they are really relevant. And for software engineering, they are relevant because, uh, as shown in the uh, example that, uh, that I referred, uh, they, <clears throat> they can allow you to provide uh, a theory and to keep it up to date because the software engineering changes every time. It's not like uh, the physics uh, or the, the, it is a social and human science and technical science where technology changes and attitude of people change uh, and society change based on new solutions that are introduced uh, in the world. So having something that is uh, often updated, really like the election, uh, like the elections is really important for software engineering research. Uh, we said we discussed a bit of sampling and it's important to have good data. It is crucial to select the right people, the right amount of people so that statistically you can do some claims. Piloting is more crucial than anything because as I remarked several times, you have just one shot. Clarity of questions and, and a tight to answer is key to have uh, good answers, uh, informed answers, uh, and uh, uh, relevant amount of answers. Because if it's not clear, they will probably start the questionnaire, but they will not finish it, okay? So it is, uh, it is important that you make an effort, again, between, uh, to stay between generality and precision at the same time. So it's a hard balance every time, and you understand the right point of the balance just with piloting. Never forget privacy issues, especially since two, 2018, they are really important, they are really key. You have to be aware of uh, also security aspects of your database uh, and you need to deal uh, with, this, uh, uh, with this type of issues. You need to specify a privacy policy and present a privacy notice uh, in your website, the link to your privacy policy. So that's it for today.